So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for those of you that have already logged in. I think we're getting attendees coming in all the time now. Um, we're due to start this session at 4 p.m. So I'll um, launch into a, a small introduction shortly. Uh, just give it another few seconds. So to start, we'd like to, on behalf of Veolia Water Technologies, extend a very warm welcome to all of you for taking the time to join us this afternoon for this webinar. Before we start, we'd like to acknowledge the respective traditional landowners of all our attendees and presenters from current locations and pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. The topic of the webinar today will be the effect of extreme weather events on water quality. Now, I've been in the water industry for more years than I care to remember, and it still scares me every time I think about the small amount of water that's actually available as being drinking, drinking water today. It's less than 0.3% of the world's water. If we combine this risk of lack of supply with the risk of the impact of extreme weather, weather events on the quality of this water, we have a really big problem on our hands and one that's getting worse and worse as the frequency of extreme weather events is becoming more and more frequent. So what is an extreme weather event? Well, basically we're talking about floods, we're talking about droughts and periods of extended high temperature. We're also talking about cyclones. And we mustn't forget uncontrolled bushfires because these are often started due to an extreme weather event. All of these events together are having a very negative effect on our water supply and the water quality in our rivers and dams. We're seeing increased algae spikes, increased levels of, of organics, TSS and other contaminants in our water supply as a result of extreme weather in Australia and New Zealand. Today's webinar We'll focus on just one of the many tools and technologies that Veolia has that to, to enable us to, to treat the negative effect of extreme weather on our water supply risk. That technology today is going to be active flow. It's a very unique and much loved Veolia technology. We're very fortunate to have a double act presenting today. We have Philippe Sauvignon, who has worked with, with Veolia since 1993. He's part of our high belief he, we dragged him out oh. of bed at 5 a.m. this morning. So, hello. Thank I'm you. Had a long coffee. Um, That's okay. <laughs> Philippe is part of our global research and development team. He also happens to be our global Actorflow expert. Uh, and there wouldn't be many of the thousand plus Actorflow references around the world that Philippe hasn't been connected with. And he's, he's been so kind to put together a webinar for us today, which looks at quite a few of our international clients' experiences where we've implemented ActiveFlow to, to take care of the effects of, on their water quality by extreme weather events. Now, it wouldn't be right to be presenting a technology without having a customer perspective at hand. So we're very fortunate that Peter Hillis has agreed to join us today. Um, hi, Peter. Hello. Um, Peter Peter's been around in the water industry for a long time, 39 years, and spent 30 years with, with United Utilities. And Peter has uh, implemented himself five projects which have included the active flow technology, the largest of which was 120 megalitres a day. So Peter's on hand, he's going to present on some of the projects he was involved in and assist in answering some of your questions. Now, active flow isn't new to us here in Australia and New Zealand. We already have 39 active flows installed across Australia and New Zealand, and we've got another one going in in early 2021 in far north Queensland. And many of these active flows are already treating the effects of extreme weather. We have one particular application which treats a very flashy river, which often gives us water above 1000 NTU. 
um, and we're consistently producing a very good quality drinking water, always below 2, two NTU and, and most of the time below 1 NTU. We're hopeful that after today's webinar, it might spike some interest in some of, some of you, you guys and you might bring us some new ideas or locations where we might be able to install ActiFlow to further assist in reducing the risk on water quality and water security in Australia and New Zealand. Now, if you have any questions during the webinar, please add them to the, the question box. You should see it on your screen now, and there'll be some time at the end of the webinar for us to answer those questions. So on that note, I'm going to pass over to Philippe and Peter now to present the webinar. So good uh, late afternoon to all you all and uh, good morning to me because it's bright and early here in France. Uh, I'd love to talk to you today about uh, this, uh, this technology active flow and uh, to set it in perspective, uh, to give you some background, uh, we are basically seeing more and more the effect of uh, climate change. And uh, in, in your respective country, it turns into uh, dust storm, bushfires, very high temperature, flood, hail, cyclones, and all sorts of uh, events that, that are becoming far too common. Um, in Australia, you have a very high reliance on dams uh, for surface water, drinking water supply. And uh, this uh, scenario means it can be affected by uh, uh, global change, floods, uh, drought period. And as an example, uh, 5 million people rely on one dam uh, for Sydney. So these events uh, generally trigger uh, very high rainfall or severe period of droughts, uh, changing nutrients and turning like algae bloom. So as, first of all, the thing we need to consider uh, and uh, is the question open, uh, we are, are we really living on a blue planet? Because uh, when we see the planet Earth uh, from, from space, it's nice and blue. Yet the quantity of water on Earth is very limited. And the one for uh, usage is uh, very, very limited, down to 0.3%. This presentation is set in the global um, uh, environment, which is uh, climate change. And uh, according to Jack, uh, when we compare period uh, of uh, the, the, the late 80s, uh, early 2000, till the end of uh, the century, this century, uh, there are two scenarios that can unfold. An optimistic one, which sees a, a rise in average temperature by 2.6 degree, and a very, let's say, pessimistic one that sees water temperatures raising by 8.5 degrees. What can be seen from these two pictures is that it primarily affects uh, northern and southern hemisphere and these uh, changes can, will be there most acute. It's a similar scenario for rainfall. Uh, rainfall will be most perturbed both in the normal hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. Just some very uh, close example to, to where I live uh, uh, in Europe that have taken place in the last uh, 18 months. Uh, you have, first of all, on the left-hand side, uh, taking place this spring uh, in uh, Austrian Alps, some severe floods. Uh, and generating uh, m quite a few destructions and obviously a uh, big impact on water supply. Likewise, in northeast France, an area where water is never ever scarce uh, over the last uh, year or so, we've seen some tremendous change in, in, in big rivers flow uh, affecting water supply. And uh, just only uh, two years ago, uh, south of Paris, uh, some severe floods on, on, on rivers that are normally nice and gentle. Even more recent, in Nice, in southern France, that happens only a month and a half ago, severe destruction due to flood and Tempête Alex that have uh, uh, destroyed a lot of houses, completely smashed uh, water supplies, power supplies, uh, and gen generally created havoc in those areas and resulting in more than 20 people killed. In Australia, there are similar scenarios to, to, to take place. Um, if we compare rainfall uh, between the, the, the early 2000 and uh, the last, uh, uh, sorry, between 2010 and 2012, um, there has been some tremendous changes in according to your Met Office. And uh, some have even joked to some extent that uh, at the time some desalination plants were built and it started raining. Uh, more detailed studies on the Murray-Darling Basin, uh, describing some uh, year 2018 as the hottest year with the most severe drought. And you'll see in the next slide that has generating some specific impact on 
on, on reservoirs and, and lakes. Uh, on River Fitzroy uh, near Rockhampton, uh, some photos there that demonstrate that the, uh, uh, um, the river can change dramatically in terms of both quality and flow for sure, uh, resulting in uh, uh, tremendous difficulty to treat water and, and to uh, produce water, uh, drinking water. The example I was uh, mentioning earlier on, uh, in drought period, uh, when nutrients accumulate in, in lakes and those lakes evaporate and uh, levels diminish, uh, algae bloom can severely impact the, the quality. This is a scenario in Perth on the, on the left-hand side. And a scenario on the Murray Darling Basins on, uh, taken by uh, uh, satellite. As you can see, some blooms affecting these, these lakes. Uh, uh, and here, the, the, the shore of the lakes where the, the algae are very, very present. These impacts, uh, they are worldwide uh, and they are uh, more acute in, uh, uh, on rivers and surface water for sure. You have here two examples, one on the left hand side in, in Norway, where they, uh, they see tremendous flow change with rapid turbidity deterioration uh, within a few hours, if not a few minutes. And another scenario that took place on Lake Erie in, uh, in Canada, uh, when they uh, they had severe algae bloom after a very hot summer, which was unusual, and they had to treat this sort of water. They had to literally shut down uh, water supply because of this issue. Some more uh, uh, global uh, effects that are more phenomenon that are seen worldwide. Uh, this is a study carried out by Lund University in Sweden. Uh, what they are seeing on their lake, they re heavily uh, rely on their lake for drinking water supplies, is a gradual increase over the last two decades in the background color and organic matter content in those waters, affecting, of course, uh, coagulation and flocculation processes. In France, a more, more close to heart uh, uh, scenario on the river that supply mainly Paris area, so the Marne, the Oise, and the Seine, we have seen a tremendous impact of flow changes uh, on the content of uh, pesticides primarily with huge variation in this content affecting, of course, water supply. As you know, we have to treat these compounds to make drinking water. And another scenario that's less obvious, but uh, very real, especially in areas where uh, uh, you have a lot of uh, uh, sheep farming and, uh, and, and cattle, um, uh, you have a higher content of uh, bacteria, viruses, and um, parasites like Cryptosporidium and Giardia due to flow changes and drought periods. So going into the heart of the, the presentation now, um, the, the, what I would like to present is how important and how we must rely on the first step of treatment for potabilization, which is clarification. And this step, this treatment is key because it helps to remove the vast majority of those suspended solids and uh, potentially algae. It's in, of course in three steps, when we have coagulation, flocculation, when we introduce a metal salts to coagulate and precipitate and turn flock, and we introduce a flocculating agent to enable this flock to swell and mature. Now the key thing afterwards is how we separate this flock from the treated water. Uh, generally, uh, historically, gravity has been used uh, and uh, this is the case in, for example, flat bottom clarifiers or in sludge blanket clarifiers. Uh, or I would say an anti gravity has also been used uh, in the form of micro bubbles when we do dissolved air flotation. Within Veolia, we've mastered since the uh, uh, early 50s a technology based on ballasted clarification, which means we increase uh, the weight and uh, the size of the flock uh, with a ballasting agent, namely microsand. And that, that this way, we can uh, speed up tremendously uh, the speed of settlement and separation uh, of flock from water. So why ActiFlow? Well, ActiFlow has been developed in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, for uh, drinking water supply in the greater suburb of Paris. Why? Because they, uh, we rely there uh, heavily on the three rivers that I've mentioned. And these rivers are susceptible to flow changes uh, primarily early winter and, uh, and um, early spring, 
uh, due to heavy rainfall. Uh, after all, we have a very oceanic climate uh, and uh, uh, these uh, changes in flow and, and rainfall means that there are uh, a lot of suspended solids of, uh, that are carried out in the water of these rivers. So we needed something that was able to settle those solids very efficiently. Another constraint, uh, there are t about 10 million people to supply with water in this area. And of course, we needed plants with very, very large capacity. Uh, the other uh, last constraint, and not the least, is uh, it's a heavily dense area with a, a lack of space, and therefore we needed a very compact process. And this is where active flow comes in uh, due to its compactness. So the, the process itself relies on uh, ballasting the flock. And we do this uh, by introducing microsound, which is uh, particles of pure silica, about 100 microns. And we bind them literally with the flock, with the hydroxide flock, um, using a, a, a glue, uh, which is uh, basically polymer. And this polymer uh, literally enables uh, this uh, flock, ballasted flock formation. If you look at uh, active flow flock under the microscope, this is what it looks like. Um, this is typically up to a few millimeter in size, uh, so it can very easily be seen to the naked eye. Uh, and um, it is stuffed literally with uh, two, three dozens of microsound grains. So the process itself, in terms of schematic, is split into three compartments. You first have uh, uh, the coagulation tank, where the raw water comes in. Uh, it's generally dosed with coagulant, for example, ferric chloride or an aluminum sulfate. It is also the tank where we modify the pH, if need be, by uh, adding lime or sulfuric acid or caustic soda, depending on the, the chemistry scenario. Uh, in this tank, with a very short contact time, we um, uh, generate, start to destabilize the charge and uh, start to generate the flock. We then enter into what we call the flocculation tank or the maturation time uh, tank. Uh, in this tank, we reintroduce the microsound and we also introduce the polymer. Uh, we use um, uh, an agitation that's very powerful to maintain this, uh, this uh, microsound in suspension. And this is where the flock that you've seen previously forms, swells and mature. The sound has got one other benefit. Uh, it acts as a catalyst of the flock formation. So the flock formation in terms of speed is tremendously increased, uh, generally uh, seven to 10 times. Once we leave this, uh, this tank and we enter into the settling zone, uh, the uh, ballasted flock literally plummets down to the, to the bottom. And this schematic is very true whereby the very vast majority of the flock settles to the bottom, whilst the clarified water is allowed to climb up across the lamellar plate, which acts as a hydraulic uh, dampener uh, uh, before the clarified water comes out of the process by overflow. The microsound and sludge is gathered by a scraper towards a central hopper, and from this hopper, it is drawn constantly with a, uh, a quarry-type pump, a sound pump. This pump is the driving force to feed the hydrocyclone and enable to separate the microsound, which, uh, which is the heavy particles, enabling it to return back into the flock tank, from the light particles, the flock, which is drawn out of the process. So this loop runs all the time. So the key element that enable this, uh, this process to work, they are here described. You first have the recirculation pump, and as you can see, there are a centrifugal split disc with a rubber lining to protect them from abrasion. Uh, these are the type of pump that are generally used in the mine industry, in the quarry industry. And the other element is, of course, the hydrocyclone. You are seeing here the hydrocyclone uh, in Geneva. Uh, and uh, 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 as I said before, the driving force enables uh, a vortex to be formed within the cyclone, which, like a uh, 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 a centrifuge effect uh, separate the heavy particles that are gradually drawn towards the bottom from the large particle, the flock, which is allowed to uh, overflow from the cyclone. We have to take care of uh, uh, issues of potential uh, abrasion because microsound is very abrasive. And this is why, if you bare metal, this is what could happen. 
uh, and in order to take care of this, we rubber line all these equipment where velocity of uh, sound slurry is very high. So I've got here a, a video of um, a jar test that's actually carried out real time. So you'll see here the, um, uh, the, the, the stopwatch uh, where we uh, demonstrate how quick and effective ActiFlow, first of all, can be uh, modelized and replicated in the beaker and uh, how responsive it is. So we've introduced the microsound, which you've just seen, we've introduced ferric chloride as a coagulant. And uh, uh, this is the, um, the stage where we have the coagulation. If need be, we would adjust the pH at this stage. I will speed up a little bit the, uh, uh, the, the process. Um, we will then introduce, uh, after a good minute of agitation, vigorous agitation, we will then introduce the polymer. And um, I'll just go to the stage where we introduce the polymer. Oh, sorry, I hope it's coming anytime. There you go. Um, so as the polymer is uh, is injected, uh, you will see that uh, this ballastic fork form. You you start to see uh, the uh, the water clarifying in between. Yeah. Um, and uh, we've adjusted the speed of the mixer to slightly slow it down uh, whilst still making sure the micro sound is well into suspension. And I'm going to speed up to two minutes uh, where uh, we're going to start to uh, stop the mixer. Uh, so we're there close to two minutes. The mixer is actually stopped. Magic, one bam, within 10 seconds, all the flocks is drawn back to the bottom of the, of the unit. So the end result of this exercise uh, is shown on the right-hand side at Phineas Ferry Power Station near Liverpool, uh, where these old uh, uh, sludge blanket clarifier that you're seeing on the top picture have been replaced by a package plant active flow uh, that can fit uh, uh, into a, a, a large trailer. So you've understood active flow is very fast and very responsive. Um, and you have here a, a set of photos that were taken uh, in Canada uh, um, on, uh, um, on rivers of River St. Lawrence uh, in, uh, near Montreal. Um, this, uh, this is based on a trailer uh, a mobile unit that is used as a demonstration plant, which treats uh, approximately 0.5 uh, uh, megalitres per day. And uh, you have here the raw water, very turbid, uh, especially when they get uh, snow melt, uh, they suddenly get massive turbidity swings, uh, and a lot of silt and clay that's carried by the river. Here you have the clarified water at the end of the process. And here in the sampling area, you have, of course, the raw water there, clarified water and the sludge. A similar exercise carried out in totally different circumstances uh, in the autumn, uh, when uh, leaves are falling and you get a lot of um, and a lot of uh, organic matter into water, this is on lake water. Uh, you can see extremely colored, not necessarily a lot of suspended solids. It's just humic acid, fulvic acid that are giving this brownish teaish color uh, to to the water. Uh, of course, coagulant to create the flot and and uh, uh, then active flow to separate it. And on the right-hand side, same scenario, raw water, clarified water, and sludge. So you've understood ActiFlow is very versatile, and we've implemented in many, many countries, uh, 57 countries as far as I know, with over 1,000 references. Um, you have here some big examples uh, of plants over uh, 100 MLD, uh, either in the UK, uh, just next to Heathrow Airport, supplying part of uh, Western London, uh, Quebec City, which is a 240 MLD plant on the River St. Laurent. Uh, Red Deer uh, in, in the US, in the Rockies, where they have a, a, a big snowfall uh, and meltdown and uh, therefore uh, a massive change in turbidity. Madrid in Spain, which is supplied by reservoirs that are affected severely by algae bloom in summertime. It's uh, six meters cube per second, so it's extremely large plants. Uh, these active flow you're seeing there, they are, these, these baby active flow are used to treat and thicken the sludge of the main active flow that's over here. And Beijing, uh, again, a very large plant, 
Mary Siroise, which is one of also the main plant in, uh, in suburb Paris. So as you've understood, ActiFlow has been implemented in many countries and different river qualities. Uh, some example of package plants, ActiFlow can come in very large size uh, and very mini. Uh, our Japanese colleagues have uh, created the, the mini ActiFlow. Incidentally, um, that has been used on uh, the Fukushima disaster to treat some contaminated water. Uh, we have these mobile plants. This is uh, the Hassel's Green in the UK, in South London. Uh, but they are, can be transportable. Uh, and even some very large flow. In Canada, they have uh, about 50% of their reference are made of prefabricated steel units uh, that are moved around the country, uh, especially in the, uh, 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 for uh, uh, tramp retreatments. So some example close at heart, because I've worked in the UK for uh, 15 years and I've been involved in this project. You have here two projects, uh, Weo and Olfa. Weo is on the reservoir in the um, uh, Pennine area, uh, not far from Manchester. And uh, this reservoir, uh, uh, very tight space. You're seeing the plant is over here. You're seeing the dam. Uh, this is the same reservoir in summertime, 2018, and this is winter uh, before. Uh, so prefabricated steel units uh, with very variable water changes because of uh, the level in the reservoir and algae bloom. And another example on the River Dudden, which is uh, in the Lake District, beautiful area with salmon fishing. Uh, again, very tight constraint because of planning applications uh, issues and therefore you needed to, it's an area of outstanding beauty, so you need to make sure you do something that doesn't stand out too much. And the river itself, uh, very changeable uh, with uh, 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 flow variation that can be quite tremendous. On that specific uh, slide, I will uh, hand over to Peter, who will give you some more background because we've been involved together on these projects. Okay, thanks, Philippe. Uh, so I wanted really to talk you through my experience of how it's been applied on projects I've worked on. Uh, and, and there were, I guess, three reasons why uh, I got interested in active flow in like, 20 years ago or so. First of all was uh, footprint. Uh, when working in a large utility in the UK with a big asset base, uh, need to upgrade plants, uh, footprint and footprint shapes were big issues at all of these sites. Also, the fast startup, so the ability to pop the plant to uh, start up quickly uh, as well as shut down quickly as well. And that then gives us flexibility in the operation. So they were the sort of main reasons. As, as Philip said, Weo was a, a covered upland reservoir uh, that uh, also suffered from algal blooms as well. Uh, the plant was built in uh, the 1950s and upgraded in the 1980s. It had uh, existing clarifiers and daft plants. And normally in the UK in the 90s, uh, daft was seen as the solution for uh, low stability, high color algae laden reservoir. Uh, but we installed active you can see on the third picture on the top row we went for the package system here and and the, why did we do that well the, the, this size is extremely constrained uh also constrained in terms of constructability what we could do from a construction perspective so it made sense to have prefabricated units uh brought to the site and craned in rather than trying to pour concrete uh, so you can see there's three units running in parallel uh, and the interesting thing about this plant is the plant actually doesn't use all the units all the time. Uh, so it rotates the units uh, be because it doesn't require its maximum capacity all the time. The units are rotated and cycled around. And actually that's built into the SCADA system as well. So the, all the units are run on an even time over, over a 30 day period, let's say. Uh, the other uh, plant on the bottom, the Ulfa plant. This, this is an interesting plant. Again, this was a plant that was built in the 80s. It was a direct filtration plant originally, uh, which is direct abstraction from a, a river source that has most of the time low organics and low utility. I think this was the reason why the filtration was chosen. However, as soon as it rained, uh, the plant uh, couldn't cope with the rapid changes in turbidity. So as part of that, and also the plant was actually built underground as well, uh, and that was due to the sensitive nature uh, and the planning restrictions. But uh, when we had to upgrade the plant, uh, again in the 2000s, really was to take the load off. Uh, and again, the active flow process fitted perfectly into this scenario because one, it gave us uh, a small footprint in the center of the area, 
uh, and also the ability to deal with these rapid changes. We also, on, on this project in Britain, started to develop uh, and working with Philip our enhanced coagulation feed forward uh, control process consisting of UV254 and stability. Uh, as you can imagine, from abstraction into the inlet of the works is is less than five minutes. So we have to have a system that can react rapidly. There's no storage to smooth out any of these peaks. As soon as the pumps take the water from the river, it's pretty much directly into the plant as well. Uh, do you want to move on to Sutton Hall, Philip? Of course, this is such an old. Yeah. Uh, now the other, uh, uh, the larger the three projects, uh, just later, I mean, where was about 26 megalitres a day, and it was 20 megalitres a day. Uh, Sutton Hall was the largest active road project I was involved with, 120 megalitres a day. Uh, this is a strategically important site. Uh, it's a sole source to 300,000 people on the Whittle Peninsula, which you can, I don't know if you can see by mass, but uh, the peninsula is just to the top right, so uh, and it's just opposite the city of Liverpool. And it's fed from the River Dee. Uh, and again, we have this challenge of uh, turbidity uh, changing from less than one NTU to over 200 NTU in, in a relatively short period of time. This plan also, uh, the river also runs through uh, agricultural land, a bit of industrial, there's some uh, wastewater discharges. So it has all of the, Challenges you'd expect from a modern plant. It's got MIB and Josmin issues. It has variable alkalinity. Uh, it's got industrial pollution. Uh, it's got pesticides and herbicides from runoff. It has uh, cattle uh, farming, so it's got uh, pathogen risk from that as well. Uh, and the plant was built in the 1930s, expanded in the 80s. Uh, but when we looked to upgrade the plant, uh, in, the, in about 2004, 2005, we found there were some significant structural issues with the existing clarifiers, which meant we had to abandon them and uh, build a plant, build build a new uh, clarifier. And again, uh, this plant is in is is constrained not only by the footprint but also some pretty tough geotech. Uh, it's pretty hard rock there, so there was only a limited amount of land that was really economically exploitable. And the active flow fitted perfectly into that. We also had to fit into the existing hydraulic profile and also be constructed, commissioned, whilst maintaining the old plant uh, as well. So, uh, again, it was that uh, footprint and flexibility uh, that that fitted nicely. We also dosed PAC into this plant as well. So, Billy later will talk about the active car, but here we have active flow with PAC. So, it's just a single. A dose of PAC into the existing active flow system uh, and to deal with uh, any high levels of, of, of uh, micro pollutants we have GAC filters downstream so again we had to integrate the plant in with the existing process existing hydraulic profile and understand the upstream and downstream issues as well I just the sort of uh, in working with uh, Philippe and Viola, we, we developed a, a masterclass approach for, for United Utilities where we were, because we had a number of plants to build, we wanted to ensure that we were learning lessons and involving operators, uh, the designers uh, and the technology providers as well, uh, and really homing in on critical control points, uh, specific areas where we needed redundancy, uh, some design parameters. So a lot of these plants you can do average flow with one unit out of service. So the Sutton Hall, for example, is 120, but its average flow is 92 megalitres a day. So it's running pretty hard all year round and, and it can meet that flow with two units uh, operating at one out of service uh, for maintenance purposes as well. Uh, and also confirming what those design loading rates are. So we generally design our, or we're designing plants around 40 metres an hour based on the on the footprint. Uh, and we didn't really do anything with, with the upstream uh, coagulation and, and maturation tank other than I guess as, as I alluded to that we developed our own enhanced coagulation system and we were using static mixes upstream of the active flow particularly to mix the coagulant chemicals as well uh, so I mean all round experience have been really positive uh, the, the plants have, have been in operation and I've had no complaints from them I left the UK in 2011 and the plants are still successfully operating so I think I'll hand yeah, it was back commissioned, yeah, it was commissioned in early 2004, um, and uh, uh, I've, I've put on this slide a, a, a graph which shows how 
on and off, like Peter described, uh, this plant is operated. On the on the right hand side, you have the scale of raw water turbidity, and you can see that uh, within one night it can change quite significantly. And on the uh, left hand side, you've got the scale for clarified water turbidity from stream one, stream two, and stream three. And as this Peter described, you can see the purple uh, uh, line appearing across the, the graph when we started on uh, the unit. Uh, uh, and uh, literally, when you have a turbidity jumping from uh, 5 to 40, 50, uh, uh, the plant, in terms of clarified water turbidity, doesn't bat an eyelid. Another example, uh, similar scenario as, uh, as um, Sutton Hall, at this time on the River Thames. Uh, west of uh, London, uh, very close to Heathrow Airport. In fact, uh, uh, if you get the chance to fly to London, uh, you'll be able to see it generally, um, providing there's no clouds. Um, joke apart, uh, sorry about that. Um, but this, uh, this plant is interesting because it had existing uh, flood, uh, sludge blanket clarifier that you're seeing here on the uh, big red circle uh, with a capacity of 150 MLD. And I was replaced by uh, this active flow plant here with two streams, each of them with a capacity of 90 MLD, so 180 in total. Uh, and uh, the River Thames also has, uh, uh, in uh, springtime, some very uh, high turbidity swings. You got uh, here the records that was taken during the first year of operation. It's operational since late September 2005. This dates back from 2006 with uh, massive turbidity change over a few days and clarifying turbidity that doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't change whatsoever. Uh, an example of this sort of scenario, uh, this time in, the, in Australia on, uh, on a uh, power station at Stanwell. Uh, here on the graph, you're seeing the turbidity and the total suspended solids. So blue and orange, uh, in red is the total dissolved solids. Um, you have these very sudden changes in uh, turbidity from the Fitzroy River, which supplies the, uh, the cooling tower. And active flow was implemented to, in effect, remove uh, these very high level of suspended solids and uh, uh, get rid of the mud that was literally accumulating at the bottom of the cooling towers. So this is what the plant looks like. Again, it's in prefabricated steel package plants. Uh, three streams, and uh, you are seeing here on the before and after scenario at the bottom of the cooling towers, the changes in turbidity and also the accumulation of uh, silt, clay, mud uh, at the bottom of the cooling towers, which enable the plant uh, to operate much more reliably. Um, the feedback from the operator there is uh, they, they, they love the, uh, uh, the responsiveness of the process. It's a uh, very short residence time, you have a single drop of water, takes about 10, 15 minutes to go from inlet to outlet. So it's, it's fast and responsive. Um, you, you, you can uh, settle to its baseline uh, performance very, very rapidly from, from cold start. Uh, it's robust, allowing uh, to cope with a very variable water quality, and that's what we, we're, we're calling it for. And uh, uh, a nice feedback from the operator, it actually works. So you've understood that uh, active flow is a very good tool to remove suspended solids, silt, clay, algae. But really, um, it's, uh, there are other issues to generate drinking water that can be affected uh, with uh, climate change. Uh, and these there are three categories of compounds. Um, first of all, there are the compounds in the blue box that cannot be seen to the naked eye. Uh, but are uh, uh, modifying their concentration due to uh, drought period and flood period, of course. Uh, they are uh, generally pesticides and other endocrine disrupting compounds like uh, uh, pharmaceutical residues, as example. And they have a, a long-term effect on health. Uh, there are other compounds uh, like uh, organic matter. Uh, this organic matter can be an issue or is an issue when we start to disinfect water with uh, chlorine. Why? Because we uh, generate uh, uh, disinfection byproducts, uh, for example, free halomethane, THM, or haloacetic acids. And these uh, compounds are carcerogenic and they need to be limited and controlled. And therefore, if we control the organic matter efficiently, we also uh, remove the risks of forming high THM and haloacetic acids. 
In addition, this organic matter can create higher chlorine demand in the network and it promotes biofilm growth. And lastly, uh, there are other compounds like uh, uh, molecules that generate taste and odor that are uh, associated with algae and some algae toxins uh, that can be very harmful to health like microcysteine. So all those compounds need to be treated. So first of all, with regards to natural organic matter, well, as you can see from the bottom uh, uh, right hand uh, uh, graph, there is a direct link between the content of uh, dissolved organic carbon and the potential of uh, THM formation. So this is why, uh, as an example, in France, we have a, a regulation of uh, on a TOC or DOC, sorry, that's supplying in drinking water. We must not ex exceed 2 ppm. And again, because uh, that means we have a, a residual or potential formation of THM that's below 100 ppb. Uh, this is very key to apply, and it's a very good rule of thumb to know. So the lower you can have your DOC in the treated water, the better for many uh, uh, points. First of all, the risk of colored water, the risk of disinfection byproduct uh, generation, potential biogro re bi biofilm regrowth, and also because this uh, uh, DOC is a competition for uh, absorption with micropollutants like pesticides. Another issue, what the parameters that we need to treat, I, I uh, alluded on some of them earlier on, these are the ones that you generate when you have blue-green blue algae, and in particular when blue-green algae die. Uh, they release uh, compounds that are, uh, that are potentially harmful to health, like hepatotoxin, microcysteine, and others that make uh, drinking water very uh, unpleasant to drink. Uh, because the human palate can detect them, like jasmine and methylisoborneol. More imp on a wider spectrum, um, some other issues that can be found, uh, not just in drinking water, but because they are released by uh, human activities via wastewater discharge in watercourse. Uh, there can be some refractory uh, uh, chemical oxygen demand, some pharmaceutical residues, some synthetic color and, of course, synthetic uh, uh, micropollutants. And they can find their way in the water course uh, and accumulate in particular during periods of drought. So that's why we have developed uh, since the early 2000s a process called Actiflow Carb. And Actiflow Carb combines the best of both worlds. It combines uh, the ability of Actiflow to clarify extremely efficiently because of microsand with the ability of PAC to absorb uh, the molecule that I described before. So Actiflow Carb uh, is a, a four-stage process. You have uh, uh, the, the PAC contact tank here uh, on number two, where uh, the slurry of PAC is, in the, is uh, mixed with raw water to be treated. And uh, PAC is the workhorse uh, of, the, of the process. This is where the absorption uh, uh, phenomenon takes place and when these molecules are bound to the PAC. We then use ActiFlow to clarify this slurry of PAC. We have level of PAC in there of uh, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 milligrams per litre. So it's, uh, it, it looks really black like uh, the photo on the uh, left-hand side. We then introduce coagulant, flocculant, microsand, like uh, in any active flow, and we enable this slurry of PAC to settle extremely fast, like in this beaker. Uh, this is pretty much taking real time in 10, 15 seconds. Yeah, everything's down at the bottom. And obtain from this all a uh, very superior quality uh, clarified water, free of all these pesticides and algal toxins. For sure, we want to maximize the PAC usage. And that's why on the, uh, on the hydrocyclone, we recirculate a slurry of microsand and PAC. So the microsand is separated because it's heavier. It goes back in the flock tank and the PAC goes out in the cyclone overflow. The very vast majority of this PAC slurry is returned back into the process and we waste off uh, used so-called used PAC in proportion to the fresh PAC that we add at the front end. That way, we are able to renew the PAC uh, uh, content of the process on a constant basis. And more importantly, uh, we can increase and decrease according to the level of performance that we are wishing to obtain. 
So Actiflow Carb has demonstrated worldwide that it can uh, tackle algae in a very efficient way. You have here records uh, dating back from 92 to uh, early 2011 uh, from plants all across the world, uh, US, China, uh, UK, France, uh, where we demonstrate that we can trap algae within a uh, uh, ballasted flock. And this photo on the uh, bottom right hand side is there to demonstrate it in excess of 99% generally, and most importantly, every time above 90%. That's why in some cases, when water is particularly difficult to treat, when algae bloom are very severe, when the organic matter content is very high, uh, when you potentially have a lot of pesticide, and this is the case in uh, Western France, where there's a lot of agriculture, uh, where there's a lot of influx of pesticides, uh, uh, there are some uh, impounding reservoirs relatively uh, shallow, uh, affected by uh, algal bloom because of nutrients. We combine active flow followed by active flow carbs. So active flow is first there to remove suspended solids and the bulk of the organic matter. And active flow carb is there to do the polishing work on algal toxins, on remaining algae, uh, and of course on micropollutant and polishing up as well the dissolved organic carbon. You have here the records uh, uh, at a plant near Saint Malo uh, where we have uh, algal bloom with uh, close to 80,000 cells per milliliter uh, in uh, the raw water, clarified by active flow. So we jump from cells per milliliter to cells per liter. So we have in effect three log removal of algal concentration. And active for carb then polishes up all this by another 99.9%. So globally, you have enough more than six log removal of uh, algae uh, with this two-step treatment. So you have here a video that is uh, similar to the previous exercise with the raw water here. And on the uh, uh, right-hand side, the beaker where we've introduced microsan, coagulant, ferric chloride in this case, and polymer. And you are seeing the settlement time, real time. Uh, everything comes down the bottom and we trap all the algae into uh, the ballasted flock. Some compounds that are associated with these algae that need to be removed. Um, Basically, with regards to uh, a molecule like methylisoboreal, which is released by uh, blue-green algae generally, uh, you have to be aware that the human palate is able to sense it, to detect it, down to 10 nanograms per liter. This is pretty much as uh, sensitive and effective as the best analytical method that are applied today with uh, GCMS, for example. Um, we have uh, purposefully uh, on, a, on a pilot trial spiked uh, uh, raw water with different level of MIB and we've looked at the removal uh, provided by active flow carb uh, and as you can see we have a, 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 a very effective removal but most importantly that can be tuned with this dose of PAC that we constantly renew, renew in the process and therefore adjust the performance versus the quality that we wish to achieve. A similar exercise with jos Josmin, um, again, it gives a very uh, unpleasant taste to water. And after all, you want people to drink uh, water from the tap. Uh, you don't want just uh, to use it to wash your hands. Um, it, th in this particular instance, the human palate is also uh, extremely sensitive, down to five nanograms per liter. And here we do total removal thanks to uh, active carb. Ractifocarb is not just used to polish up uh, algae issue, to polish up pesticides. It's also used, and you have here an example, uh, not far from Toronto on Lake Ontario, with an area called, uh, it's not far from Niagara Falls, by the way, um, uh, an area which has been heavily contaminated by uh, years of uh, heavy industries, primarily steel mill industries. Uh, and they draw, uh, the, the city of Hamilton draws uh, their drinking water supply from the shore of the lake. Uh, this, uh, this area is polluted with HAP, uh, with residual uh, uh, surfactants, uh, with some uh, uh, medical residues, but it's also contaminated with flame retardant like PFOS and PFAS. 
uh, we have a double step treatment here with uh, active flow and active flow carbs. So you've got here the data on PFOS, for example, uh, in uh, uh, micrograms per liter um, with uh, a, a first step removed. Some of it is removed by active flow because some of it is bound to the organic matter content and well polished up with active flow carb uh, down to level that are almost uh, uh, difficult to detect. We have also uh, enhanced uh, active flow. Um, you have to be aware that uh, uh, Veolia has uh, been working with ozone for more than a century. Uh, and uh, we've noticed that we can boost the performance of, uh, uh, of active flow carb by introducing a small amount of ozone at the front end of uh, the PAC reactor. Uh, the reason why is that uh, it super boosts or supercharged the uh, absorption capacity of, uh, of a PAC and uh, uh, enabling it to perform on even more difficult molecules to tackle. There are now some pesticides that are so hydrophilic that are very difficult to remove by, uh, by carbon absorption alone. And uh, uh, this combination of ozone and PAC develops extremely good performance. You have here the chromatograph of uh, feed into the treatment. In orange, uh, the uh, active flow carb alone, and in yellow, the combination of active flow carb with ozone. The usual question that's asked when we use ozone is you have the potential to form bromate, so ozone byproducts. In this case, this is not uh, happening. Why? Because the oxidant, the ozone, is directly mixed with a, uh, a reducing agent, the PAC, and therefore we do not have the time to generate uh, ozone byproducts. So another usage of active flow, which is very important and has been developed uh, mainly for the power industry initially, but now more recently for drinking water supply, is active flow soft. Uh, and active flow soft is used to remove hardness and alkalinity. Uh, and to, uh, as its name says, uh, soften the water. Uh, hard water can be an issue for a variety of reasons. Uh, it, it's an issue because generally when you distribute water with, uh, that, are, that is very hard, uh, people tend not to drink uh, this water and they tend to buy bottled water, which is very bad for the environment. Um, so, uh, and also in terms of energy, uh, if you have a uh, um, systems for uh, heating, uh, uh, dishwasher, washing machine, they work a lot better with very soft water. Uh, there is an interest because as well, uh, uh, this lime can provide lime scaling uh, on, on, the, on the pipes, on the distribution network and create all sorts of issue in terms of distribution. So Active Flow Soft has been developed just for that. Uh, it is very similar to uh, Active Flow Carb in the sense that there is a pre-contact tank where we introduce uh, lime, uh, lime slurry or caustic soda, and we mix it with recirculated carbonate sludge. We then uh, uh, introduce coagulant in the uh, coagulation tank and microsound polymer to bind all these carbonate to the flock and settle. In order to enhance the performance and more importantly to act as a catalyst of the uh, uh, CaCO3 particles formation, we recirculate the sludge. And this is why the process is so effective. It's based on the cold, cold lime softening process. So you have here an example uh, at Ati Water Treatment Works in Dublin, uh, which is supplying uh, part of uh, southern Dublin and also a, a very large plant by Intel because they wanted. Uh, soft water. This river uh, in Ati is very hard and also contains a lot of organic matter. Uh, it's uh, very colored. Uh, TOC can go up to 20 ppm uh, and uh, contains as well a lot of suspended solids. With active flow alone, uh, they were uh, working and uh, they were treating this water very effectively, yet they had to use a uh, large amount of ferric and acid to work in uh, the best condition to remove organic matter. By introducing active flow soft at the front end, they were able to minimize their uh, uh, coagulant and uh, uh, acid consumption fourfold. Uh, so it's quite tremendous. Uh, why? Because on softened water, then you don't need to dose nowhere near as much coagulant and you don't need to deplete the pH. So ActiFlow Soft being implemented there, it's a, a, a 
40 MLD plant uh, that has been operational since 2006. Um, some data on active flow soft. Uh, why? Because it's purely chemistry. Uh, you have the record here in terms of alkalinity uh, of the raw water and alkalinity of the treated water. We are able with active flow soft to go down uh, uh, by dosage of lime or caustic to the uh, solubility of CaCO3 down to 20, 30 uh, uh, milligrams per liter as CaCO3 on the mound, and that's uh, directly matched with the dose of lime. The beauty of this process is that it clarifies as well extremely well. Uh, we can operate at rise rates that are uh, uh, up to 80 meter per hour with very low suspended solids. And at the same time as removing hardness and alkalinity, we also tackle a good portion of DOC. The key thing here is that uh, we do not uh, generate catalytic softening. Uh, it, it, we really uh, separate two types of particles. You have here some photos under the microscope, so that's uh, all on the same scale, uh, same magnifying uh, uh, on the microscope. Uh, you have here the um, microsand, here are the uh, pellets of CaCO3 that are generated, and here the mix of the two. If you look at them on the uh, uh, granulometric analysis, you have the particles of microsand here, and you have the pellets of CaCO3. So it's, a, it's really two different compounds that are treated well separately, uh, and that's why with the, micro, uh, with the hydrocyclone, we can separate these very efficiently because the cutoff size is there. So this goes in the overflow in the sludge, and this goes in the underflow back into the tank. Lastly, some study that was done at Tampa Bay uh, in Florida uh, nearly eight, well, 18 years ago. Um, I mentioned that uh, extreme weather can generate severe changes in terms of bacterial count, but more importantly, cryptosporidium and jada in, in uh, uh, parasites in raw water. Uh, with the, um, uh, the uh, assistance uh, of uh, CH2 mill in the US, CH2 mill consultant, we carried out some comparative tests uh, between active flow, a pulsating clarifier, and DAF on the removal of uh, spiked uh, uh, raw water with uh, crypto and Jardia spores. Uh, and as you can see, active flows demonstrated well over two log removal of these spores for an inlet concentration that was between 10 and 20,000 cells per milliliter. So a summary of what is the operational cost of active flow. The reason why I put this slide is because uh, a lot of people uh, uh, comment about the microsand and think that microsand is, uh, is uh, a tremendous amount of, uh, of, the, of the cost of active flow. In fact, it isn't at all. Uh, microsand is, uh, first of all, readily available. And in terms of the global running cost of an active flow, it only accounts for a very small amount, around 1%, 0.5%. It's minimal. Why the bulk of the cost is coagulant and a pH adjustment agent, like a sulfuric acid, for example. Polymer accounts for about 10%, power for about 15%, and as I said, uh, a microsand for a very small proportion. So as a conclusion, you've understood that uh, active flow has been developed to tackle uh, sudden variation in raw water quality. Uh, it can deal with very turbid water. It can also deal with water with virtually no turbidity when it is ever so difficult to, to create flock. We now have a breath, a massive amount of experience. We've installed uh, active flow as far off as uh, Middle Greenland in Thule for on an American Navy base to, as far as I know, the most southern one is in Tasmania, uh, 57 countries, big and small. Um, you've understood that the process is extremely compact and it doesn't uh, withstand any comparison with any other clarifier uh, uh, processes in terms of size. Um, and therefore, it can be prefabricated with very large flows. Uh, it is therefore competitive on capex uh, compared to any other clarifiers. It's a beast to remove algae and uh, deal with bloom. And uh, let's say the, the baby active flow that are active flow carb and active flow soft uh, are uh, 
great enhancement and can provide superior level of treatment with compounds that are uh, 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 increased in terms of uh, severeness and uh, difficulty during uh, drought period in particular, making it uh, like this picture, the Swiss army knife uh, in terms of clarification. And this is why it's the ultimate treat tool to treat your water. Thank you very much. Thanks, Philippe. That was brilliant. Great presentation. Really interesting. Um, do you want to show yourself? Yes, of course. We've got a, we've got a few questions for you. <laughs> so feel free to fire away. Okay, so I've had a couple that have come through during the, during the presentation. One is about wear and tear issues on moving parts. Is this a big problem? Are you spending a lot of money in replacing moving parts due to the sand abrasion? Well, um, it, it, it is an issue, yeah, we, it's, a, it's a definitely good question. Uh, of course, uh, micro sand is very abrasive. Uh, silica is a very hard product. Uh, providing you take, in terms of engineering, good care of the, um, of the design of the equipment that uh, you are used, uh, using to, uh, to, to, to pump and to cyclone the, uh, the, the slurry, uh, there is no issue. Uh, uh, the, like I've shown, the type of pump that we use uh, is a, a split disc with a rubber lining. There are pumps that are used in quarry industry, in the mining industry. They are extremely robust. Uh, of course, uh, uh, this liner has to be changed. Uh, in fact, uh, 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 generally, uh, it's between two and five years, the lifetime, depending on usage. Uh, but it's a very uh, uh, easy operation. Uh, I've done it myself, and I'm not a mechanical fitter by no means. Uh, uh, it takes a couple of hours uh, uh, single-handedly to, to do it. Um, likewise for the hydrocyclone. Uh, the hydrocyclone, the, the area where uh, abrasion is most acute is the apex, for sure, but that's where the, air, the concentration of microsun is the highest. Uh, and uh, uh, these, uh, these elements are, are replaceable. They are wear parts, uh, so uh, the liner itself can be replaced, but generally uh, there's a wear part that uh, can be uh, substituted like for like. Uh, one thing I, uh, that Peter mentioned uh, in, in what he said about active flow is uh, generally because those elements are key for the operation of the process. Uh, uh, these elements, as part of the uh, of the of the process in terms of design, are duplicated. So on uh, the UK active flow that you've seen, uh, there is always a duty standby recirculation pump, a duty standby recirculation pipe, and likewise for the idos which means that maintenance can be carried out whilst the unit is still in operation. Okay, that makes sense, yeah. So there's some other questions here. I see someone's put them onto a slide for us, so that's great. How much sand loss would you expect on a 100 megalitre a day plant? Well, the sand loss is a typically around one gram per meter cube per day, so 100 megalitre per day will lose approximately 100 kilo of sand per day. Mm -hmm. Track record to prove it. And what about the sand quality? Is it a very specific type of sand that we need, or is it easily, normally easily, readily available? Well, it is. It is a specific type of sand. You've seen it from the granulometric analysis. Uh, so the first key element it has it has to be pure silica, or as close as possible as you can have in terms of uh, purity, nearly 100%. Why? Because you don't want to introduce other compounds. And you want silica because it's chemically inert. Uh, so it it's not going to introduce a dirtying agent into the water. That's the key thing. Uh, so the fact that it's pure silica is, uh, uh, first of all, very important. And then the second uh, parameter that's key is the size. Uh, you've seen that uh, uh, in Europe, we use a relatively uh, uh, narrow bounds uh, micro sound around 100 microns. Uh, but providing it's sieved uh, or crushed to the right size, uh, there is no issue. Uh, uh, so there is a spec. We want sound between 80 and 150 microns, and providing it's in that band, no problem. And I'm pretty sure it's readily available. Hmm. Well, I've heard there's some plants where the sand actually comes in naturally to make up the sand <laughs> entering from the river. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, there are some lucky sites. Uh, it's true. Uh, I know I told you that anecdote, but it, it is a fact. Yeah, um, uh, silt and clay and sun particle, and particularly during a, a flood period, uh, are naturally present in uh, in uh, in raw waters. And particularly when you do direct river abstraction, uh, uh, there are some plants which receive naturally uh, some micro sun from the river. It's not the case everywhere. Yeah, let's be frank, and especially not the case in reservoirs and dams. But um, uh, uh, yes, it does happen. And in those periods, I know uh, operators that uh, for months on end do not top up any sand uh, uh, whatsoever because they get it free from, from nature. That would be perfect. And what about, uh, let's make this our last question because we've gone a little bit over time, but um, what about the impact on the downstream processes? So we're using polymer and we're using sand. Is there a carryover issue to the normal types of processes we might see downstream in a, in a water treatment plant? Uh, well, yes, there is. Uh, of course, we use uh, polymer, we use flocculant, and uh, this is a compound which potentially is, uh, if overdosed, uh, is uh, um, uh, fouling for uh, sand filters and fouling for membranes, if you have any. Um, the, the key thing there is to control the dose rate, make sure it's not exceeded. So the just enough uh, is, uh, first of all, very important. And secondly, we have the antidote for this type of scenario, or let's say catastrophic event, uh, is uh, we introduce downstream of active flow, a very small dose of coagulant, uh, uh, 0.5 ppm as metal, so it's minute, it's almost homeopathy. And uh, this small amount of coagulant enabled for, with the residual flock to swell a little bit and therefore prevent what I, we call cushion flowering, uh, which is uh, a very small layer on top of filters. And it's very effective and uh, generally gets rid of the problem. Great. Well, we might as well do the last question. What's the footprint of active flow compared to DAF? It's about uh, half, uh, between one third and one, uh, one uh, half of it. Uh, okay. on, on DAF, you operate at a velocity around uh, 10, 15, 20 meter per hour. Uh, on active flow, we generally design at 40, so uh, between a third and half of the DAF. Just one, just one question on the DAF, obviously, is that actually one of the bigger components of the DAF plant is the flocculation, normally twin flocculation tanks with 10 to 15 minutes residence time as well, so I think the active flow probably has a shorter pre-treatment in terms of the flocculation as well. Okay. Yeah, that's true. That's, uh, that's a fair point, Peter. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Okay, so on that note, I think we'll close the webinar for today. So if anyone has got any other questions or would like to contact me, I'm karen.shaw at veolia.com. Um, and you, I'm sure you can find me on LinkedIn as well. Um, please send through any comments, questions, um, just want to ring me up for a chat. Love to talk to you about um, potential opportunities for, for active flow in Australia and New Zealand. And Philippe, thank you very much for joining us and getting up so early this morning. That's no problem. Yeah. It's a pleasure. Have Thank a you for listening. Day. Thank you so Take much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.